What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my Twisted Life TV. I am Poetry. You are here for another recap and review of The Handmaid's Tale, Season 3, Episode 12, Sacrifice. Now, I may talk a little fast because I got to get to work, <laughs> but this recap may be a little bit different. Um, th this episode got on my nerves, and it, it got on my nerves not for the reasons that you may think. It was the sounds, the all the auditory noises that were being repeated over and over and over again in this episode that I think was designed specifically for us. Um, it was like this episode was one big onomatopoeia, you know what I'm saying? Um, because the sounds pretty much took on a, a role as a character themselves. Maybe y'all missed it, maybe y'all didn't. Um, but I'm one of those people that am not really good with ASMR, okay? Um, people like that, they say it has misophenia. I think that's what they call it, misophenia. Like chewing, whispering, yawning. Those sounds like those can spark a negative reaction in people. Sometimes fight or flight is the response. And that's me. A lot of sounds when they repeat it over and over again get on my damn nerves. Um, it's the it's the consequence of sound, man. It's got, you know, consequence of sound. Who, who sings that? Regina Spector. Yes, my rhyme ain't good just yet. My brain and tongue just met, and they don't travel far. Wait a minute. Um, my, my rhyme ain't good just yet. My brain and tongue just met, and they ain't friends so far. They travel. I can't think of it. I'm going to think of the words in a minute. But it's the consequence of sound. Uh, Y'all got to listen to that sound. My rhyme ain't good just yet. My brain and tongue just met. And they ain't friends so far. The words don't travel far. They tangle in my hair and tend to go nowhere. They go back right inside between my brain and eyes. Right to my stomach juice where they don't serve no use. All melted calories, nutrition value use. And I absorb back in the words right through my skin and sit the festering inside my bowels, the consonants and vowels, the consequence of sound. Yeah, I love that dog. Song. Anyway, so that's basically what it was. The sound was getting on my nerves. So I'm going to try to not hit on y'all nerves as much, but I'm going I'm to hit on a few of them as we go through this recap. We open up with June in her room, standing there in a dusty, dim light. I think it's meant to be dark. Because this entire episode was meant to be a dark moment where June still shined through it all. Um, she's sitting there holding the gun, looking at it, inspecting it. You first hear her cock the gun. Or well, first hear her put the magazine in. Then she cocks the gun and puts one in the chamber. That's the first auditory noises that we hear. And then June starts to walk us through the sounds, making us pay more attention to everything that we're hearing. And this, um, by her doing this, this makes us pay attention to the sounds throughout the entire episode. Or at least it did for me. So she starts off, uh, first you hear the van. So then we hear the tires. Sprints up to the house. June is telling us what to listen for, you know. Um, be around, be, being aware of sound is very important to animals in captivity, as June is. Um, it affects their stress levels and thereby prompting behavioral responses that may benefit them. So June, like I say, says, first the vans. We hear the tires screeching to the hall. Then the doors of the car. We hear them opening. Boom. And shut, right? People chattering outside. Um, then we hear knocking on the door. Then we hear the front door open. It closes. More chatter. And then June says boots on the stairs. And so then we hear the footsteps coming down the hallway. You know. Then they get quicker. The step quickens as they get closer and closer to June's door. And then we we hear like yeah the hollow sounds of somebody's heels coming across the wooden floor. And at this point, we're having a mix of what June is telling us with the actual noises and connection to what she's telling us. The floorboard creaks and June breathes in a heavy breath, stands there with a the gun aimed and pointed at the door, ready, ready for whoever going to walk through, right? Um, the handle of the door turns, then the door bursts open. 
is Eleanor. Oh, girl, you scared me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Put that shit away, right? We got company. It's me and Dale. Stars and Beth needs your help. Like June didn't move at first. She sat down, was like, okay, what they want? <laughs> she said, my bad, you know, my bad. I didn't mean to pull that gun on you, girl. But June is feeling a little bit fearless right now. Or maybe it's just fear because in this type of situation, fear and being fearless can have the same emotional response or the same uh behavioral response once you when the, when the, when it hits you. So, but really she was thinking, Eleanor, you can get it too. I know I didn't mean to put a gun on you, but girl, you just came too close. You just might be a casualty of war. My bad. You know what I'm saying? Um, because for June, that's what she's in. She's in a state of war. And all the sounds that uh, she heard prior to Eleanor came in, basically it's the drum major. You know, when you're going into battle, you got the drum major as they're marching in. So, Whoever they're going up against, they know they're coming. The drum made just sound of intimidation. That's all those sounds, all those auditory noises that we heard coming into the room with Eleanor. June was readying herself for war. Okay? But they weren't coming for her this time. What the hell were they there for? Hmm? What they there for? June, um, after she tell her to come on down there and help Beth, Eleanor, you hear the door close, bam. Then you hear her footsteps receding down the hallway, getting softer and softer. The threat of war is less inevitable for June right now as her footsteps get quieter and quieter. Okay? But the men are there for war. Why? Because they feel they are under attack. What else could have happened to uh, Commander Stapler? You know what I'm saying? He missing. Serena and Fred just got picked up at the doggone Canadian border. The Americans, of course, they had something to do with it. Just shady asses. Somebody mentioned that Fred got put into a, a Canadian vehicle and Serena got put into an American vehicle. I didn't notice that at all. Um, but if y'all saw that, that was good, good, good eye, good, good, good catch. Um, for, but they said Fred and Serena are being held for war crimes. This is attack on the commanders. We got one missing, two snatched up at the border. This is attack on the commanders. We need to respond. Uh, Calhoun is in there. We need to close off the borders. Um, they were supposed to already have beefed up the security at the borders anyway, which is what I said before. So how the hell they was able to so easily cross over into Canada? How the heck was it so easy for Fred and Serena to just be traveling on the road alone? I didn't understand that. When Fred and Serena visited the first time, they supposedly shut off the borders then, closed them down or, or at least tightened up security around the border. So the fact that this went down so smoothly, I was very surprised about that shit. But you see how like well that worked out, right? You see how well it worked out for them. And y'all notice that they keep saying they got captured. They are in custody. They, they, they. As in Fred and Serena. But I don't care what the fuck they talking about. I got a feeling Serena is in on this man. Serena is in on it. That was a setup. A few of y'all said y'all didn't see the setup coming. Y'all didn't y'all sit on y'all still don't see it. Y'all think that, you know, she was really caring and loving and being there with Fred in that moment, the moment at the house. All that I think was true. I think it was true, but I think it was so much more intensified because she set this up. She is about to hurt the one that she loved for something that she wants. But see, that was just my gut feeling. I had that gut feeling from the beginning. It was nothing that happened in episode that said, oh, damn, you didn't see this coming? Nothing. Even the conversation she had with Rita. It didn't, like, make me like, what the fuck is going on? I thought that shit from the beginning that she was setting some shit up. Okay, so anyway. Calhoun. Calhoun ready to bust some heads. Um, Putnam is like, hold on, man. Slow down. Slow down. Let's think with calmer heads. Joey Lawrence in there, like, you know what? I, why y'all here? Why are y'all here? We up here jumping to conclusions and shit now. Like, what the hell? We finna move off some conclusions? You know, they said they got the, re the reports. Uh, everything been validated. Well, June makes it down to the kitchen finally. You hear the sound of the clanking as Beth places down the dishes. June learns that Billy is in on it. They can get a plane just in time for the finale, right? Um, then you hear the slide of the, the scone basket being pushed over at June, confirming 
Billy said yes. See, the Marthas all think that she a badass right now. For some reason, I am not feeling thrilled that everything is falling into place. Um, I don't know why. It's just not sitting with me. It's not sitting well in my spirit. It's something about it that's like, I don't know. Um, June, she seemed a bit confused as to what Beth was talking about, though, originally. Um, but the news in the network has traveled fast. What you did at the doggone Jezebels has gotten back to everybody. I'm guessing that they're thinking that June went there with the intent to kill Commander Stabler. And so now they're all impressed. Um, but like I said, again, y'all, these sounds was getting on my nerves. Beth placed her cut, cut, cut down, clank. She slid, shh, the basket of scones over. Um, every sound in this episode was amplified to me. Um, it was, it was triggering my, my fight or flight responses. Um, but every sound was basically triggering June to fight, prompting her to fight more. Uh, flight can't be her response any longer because there was no turning back. They got one week and there's a flight coming. Okay. So every single sound, every single sound, every time a door opened, you hear the wind as it swung. Um, every footstep, you hear it beat against the ground. Um, the, the, uh, zip, you know, whisk, boom, clink, pop. You know, you hear all of that throughout this entire episode. Doors closing, opening, locks clicking, deep breathing, alarms buzzing, footsteps pounding, tires were screeching, um, cups were clanking, voices clamoring. Everything is so pronounced because the battle is beginning. Okay, so June. She takes the tray from Sienna like, hey, I'm, I got this. You know June going to eavesdrop and be nosy on the conversation. Joey Lawrence was like, girl, sir, Sienna busy, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so sure. So Calhoun is like, let's send in troops. They, they are under attack, and he ain't too happy that Lawrence is in there making light of the situation. Like, they go meet with the, the council about war. So he like, so we having a meeting about planning a meeting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what the fuck? Like, he like, how can you joke at a time like this? Because it's funny. How the water fits are gone now. And y'all back here darkening my doorstep. Y'all stripped me of my high-level uh, clearance, which I was surprised to hear that they had did. We knew he didn't have, like, access to certain areas, but I know he got stripped of his clearance. They stripped him of his clearance, and now they need him. Well, Putnam said we need a voice of reason and logic and restraint. You know what I'm saying? You still got people backing you. Um... You know, knocking you back a few notches. That was just political, all political shit. But what he was really saying was, I still fucks with you, homie. I fucks with you. And I can get all your clearance levels back for you. Um, Calhoun is like, or you can sit here and act like a little bitch like you always do and hide them on your books. <laughs> Business as usual for you. Ain't that ain't that how it go? I was like, oh, Calhoun, a little testy. He's a little testy. And Putnam said, hey, show him some damn respect. My bad. I was just worried about little Dave. You know, he's still in the hospital. He's still a little fighter. He only three pounds, you know what I'm saying? Lil Dave is is um a Matthew's baby. I told you I was naming him after my best friend's, you know, son that had died. Anyway, Lawrence. He put them out like, look, I need to mull over this for a minute. Give me a little, little me, me time to myself. And putting them uh tell June as he's leaving out, you probably the only one that's happy about this whole situation, huh? June didn't know what the fuck he was talking about or who, or basically who they was talking about at that moment. But Lawrence confirms that the Waterfoots have been captured and she just got away with murder. She must have had Annalise Keaton on her team, maybe. Anyway, June hears the Waterfoots are in prison. She can't do nothing but laugh. You know, the laugh came hearty from her belly, just laugh. <laughs> You know, she had that type of laugh, right? It's all part of the auditory noises that we're supposed to be paying attention to. Um, but I really, 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 really hate. I'm going to have to write somebody. I'm telling y'all for real. They need to do away with these close fucking shots on June's face, stargazing into the fucking camera next season. They got to do that. I'm serious. I'm, I'm going to tag somebody on Twitter, on Instagram. Somebody going to have to stop that shit. 
Mark Atwood directly. Y'all getting on my fucking nerves. I'm sick of looking at Elizabeth Moss face up close like that and her look. Oh gosh. Anyway, she heads to the market. Still without a walk walking partner. Everybody else got walking partners. June still don't have a walking partner. And all the handmaids supposed to walk in pairs. Um, like when they did the overhead shot, that wasn't June that we saw. They were just showing other handmaids walking in pairs. That was to make a point that she doesn't have a walking point. And the reason why I'm saying that it was to make a point, because while we're in uh, loaves and fishes, the announcement that came over said, make sure you stay by your walking partner as well. We heard the sirens wailing on the street as she heads there. Um, and there's a special being ran on four cans of peaches and the fishes and loaves and fishes, praise be, you know what I'm saying? I was like, damn, so peach cobbler right now would sound fire. You know, they talking about them peaches to sell on the peaches. <laughs> June tells Alma, it's on, baby. You know, all the kids will be brought to the Lawrence's house after dark. Um, and I'm like, that makes no sense to me at all. Alma's concerned about her kid because of where he's at. He's far out. And she's like, hey, you trust your mother to get word out to the house so everybody can know, bring the kid in. Now, if her mother didn't say he was going to get involved, then why the fuck we going to try to do this at last minute? That's just me. But... What does not make sense at all is you're going to have all these Marthas, you know, stealing kids away in the middle of the night, sneaking them over to the Lawrence's household, right, in the middle of the night. So Lawrence, Beth, and his mentally stressed wife could cart 52 children, whining, loud mouth, tired, sleepy, hungry, children away in the middle of the night 55 people are somehow going to make it to the plane undetected from one house three adults and two children make that express that two adults and one unstable woman with 52 children skeetering through the night undetected i just don't see it if gilead security is this week there is no reason none at all that they shouldn't have rebelled years ago while we in the market number 22 order 22 you're ready another announcement just again just to say stay in high eyesight of your walking partner you know what i'm saying again june has no walking partner june heads over to meet rita who's singing her praises as well um they bond over rusted potatoes she tells her um, what the Marthas are planning, she won't in on. Um, I've had my doubts and concerns about Rita this whole time. Uh, but Rita wants to escort a child. I'm confused. Your commander and wife was just captured. They are officially gone. Why are you at a home by yourself? Or if you're not at a home by yourself, you mean to tell me you at a place that you can sneak away in the middle of the night, go to somebody else's house, help them take their child and sneak it over to the Lawrence's house in the middle of the night? Nobody going to be watching you. Your commander and wife have just got captured. June done ran away 50, 11 times and ain't nobody got eyes on you, Rita. Rita going to join the fight. That makes no sense to me. Maybe if they didn't know that the water was in custody, I could probably see her getting away with this. But anyway, she tells June she's proud of her. You the shit, bitch. June say, I am, ain't I? Well, that's the look she had on her face. <laughs> I swear, when they touched hands, though, I could not tell the difference between them. I was like, damn, Rita's hand is devoid of melanin. I could not tell the difference between those two hands. I knew which one was which just because of the position that they're supposed to be in the directional they're supposed to have been in the scene. But they looked exact same. They had some pale ass, non melanated hands. Well, anyway, this fucking prison, which we know is just a detainment center, is pretty damn laxed. It has a nice comfy bed, a big picture window. Fred still dressed all in his Sunday best, feeling rather confident. Beep. Beep. Clink. The door opens. It's Serena. Distress. She kiss, 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 kiss all him. <laughs> sniffle, 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 you know. <sighs> Sigh relief as they hold each other's. Giving y'all the impression that she was set up to. But I know better. I know better. Don't tell him anything, Fred. 
I love you. Don't say you say anything that they can use against you in trial. I don't want you to go to jail. This could mean life imprisonment for you. Or you could be extradited back to somewhere else. Like you know what I'm saying. So Fred, tell them, look at her. Tell them you ain't got nothing to do with this. You know nothing. I'll get you out of here. Don't worry about it. I'm going to protect you. I will not let anything happen to you. Serena stops. Says, what about yourself, homeboy? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm straight. Fred like, wait, what? What the fuck just happened, huh? His lips was trembling. I could hear the tremble, and there and there was no sound, but I heard that tremble. His lips were trembling. He was so disgusted. What did you do? I did it for my daughter. He like, did you just did this bitch just set me up? Yes, poetry was right. Poetry tried to tell you for it. Poetry tried to tell you that bitch shut you up. Now the one thing that I wasn't, I, I, um, no, I said this. She was truly stressed. She was truly stressed because she set up the person she loved. She knew what she had did. She had betrayed one person that she loved. Not as much as she used to, but she still loved the man. She did love his douche ass. All for baby Nicole. No heifer, it was for you. And Fred said the same damn thing. It's always been for you. Everything has been for you. Everything I've done has been for you. You right down to my very first kill it was for you, Serena. Remember, you told him how much of a man he wasn't because he wouldn't kill that dude and handle things, right? That was all for you. We incorporated this ritual, this ceremony into Gilead law because you was fucking barren and wanted you to have a way to have children. It's all been done for you, okay? I was waiting on him to choke her the fuck out. He had his hand on her neck, but he didn't choke her up, though. You know, um, she like, you made me feel like, he like, you made me feel like shit on a stick. <laughs> I pity any child that have you as a damn mother. Oh, that cut to her soul. Cut to her soul. Cut to her soul. She shook herself loose, right? He grabbed the back of her neck then. And then she know she got loose uh, and exited stave less on that ass. I'll pray for you under his eye, motherfucker. <laughs> then you hear her slapping his hand away. Battle lost, Fred. Serena won, Fred zero in this moment. Game over. Door beeps. Unlock. Buzz. Clank. Shut on that ass. <laughs> well, we heard June walking through the house. Footsteps clamoring. And then somebody crying. It's Eleanor. She needed a moment. I need a moment. I need a moment. Shout out to Jackie Christie. Naomi and Commander Stabler's wife, whose name slips my memory at this point. They in the study with Commander Lawrence. Praying for Commander Stabler's safe return and begging Lawrence to find him. June says, I'll pray for his safety, no matter where he is. No, bitch, you're going to pay for his, pray for his return. How you gonna tell me what the fuck to pray for? Okay, fine. I'll pray for that. Olivia. Olivia. How did I not know her damn name? It's Olivia. Commander Stabler and Olivia Benson. Law and Order SVU. Or Gilead SVU. <laughs> Olivia say, I'm scared for my six children. They're gonna take them away from me. And I don't know, like, your children. <laughs> Lois had to rein her in, baby. <laughs> Because <laughs> she started saying, oh, we could take them. We could take the other the other children. We can keep them safe. Don't we got room? They all be safe together. We can save them all. I fell the fuck out. I was like, yes, Eleanor, spill all the motherfucking tea, girl. Spill all the motherfucking tea. Naomi had set up like, what you talking about? Y'all peeped that. Naomi set up like, what? What would you mean? What you talking about? Man, it was giving me so much joy that Eleanor was talking. Like I said earlier, I don't know why I wasn't feeling as three of the June was having everything fall into place. But when Eleanor started spilling the bills, that made me feel good. I was like, what the fuck is going on? June, the look of panic that June tried to restrain in her face was fucking priceless. It was priceless. Eleanor tickled me to death, y'all. She tickled me. But up in Canada, Moira, Moira, and Luke. They're coming to the holding area. I can't even call that place a prison. 
my Canadian friends that have been in jail has never had it so good. They never had that cushion comfort. Fred even got bourbon up in the joint. Now, these mugs are up in the wild off Astoria. That's where they get. So, we get all the auditory noises, noises of, that one can hear going through a security checkpoint. Um, the, the, the TSA agent being rude as fuck to you, you know what I'm saying? Put that stroller there, put that bag there, put that notebook down, get everything out your pocket, take off your shoes. You know, black people rifling through our motherfucking her and shit as if we had weapons up in our goddamn her and shit. Ooh, that gets on my nerves at the fucking airport. I always get the extra search. Every fucking time we go to the airport, I get the extra search. I get the extra search coming through, plus I get the extra search at the gate again, you know, because usually when I'm going through, I'm going with my afro. I'm rocking my, I'm rocking out with my frock out, you know. I don't like her, my. I don't really don't like my hair restrained. I really like my hair flowing under. under like y'all can't tell that shit, but it be spiders and shit out there in my damn workstation. So anyway, anyway, um, Moira, she get to she like uh, you know they treating us like we criminals. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, girl, they do that. Um, you go visit anybody in jail, you may end up with a body cavity search yourself. You know what I'm saying? But if if you don't, you're still gonna go through all these little nuances of being as if you ain't going into prison your damn self. Well, Moira goes to read the rape, rape a girl. Mrs. Massa, Serena Joy, you know, um, uh, Melania Trump 2.0, she goes to meet her. She's the real traitor, the gender traitor is what she called her. I could see Melania Trump doing this to old dumbass Donald. Mm -hmm. turning on him and then everybody gonna be singing her praises that oh dumb Donald finally got it and shit I excluding her from all the shit I know that bitch in that office doing too you can't make me believe she ain't got no motherfucking power it's the same thing that they wanted us to think here on this show that Serena Joy didn't have no power no baby she's a mastermind and you better believe being with that motherfucker all these years Melania motherfucker Trump is Serena fucking Joy and she gonna be getting away with some shit. Trust and believe that shit. So anyway, uh, Tuello had told Serena that she's only detained until they done with Fred. And how did he take the news? And she's like, you know, she said what she felt about him. He's like, don't worry about him. You ain't got to worry about him no more. But that's my husband. What you mean I don't worry about him? Like I said, she still does care about his old douche ass. Um, but I can't believe they about to let this bitch go scot-free. I can't believe it. Tuello is getting on my damn nerves, too, trying to check Moira about... Uh, all the fuck she wasn't giving Serena. You know what I'm saying? If that ain't white privilege at its best, y'all. I don't know. Oh, Jelly Bean wouldn't even be fucking be there. Jelly Bean would not be there. Y'all made this deal with her, not with me. You know, and they didn't even have to hold up that end of the bargain. That That's what tells me that Serena finna get away with this shit. They didn't have to hold up that end of the bargain. Fuck her. Fuck her. Be her dry ass grits. Fuck her. Um, let that be a black, a black person. Let Serena Joy and Fred have been black. They would have been beaten, dragged a few miles by the fucking tailpipe. Um, they would have had their fingernails plucked off, uh, starved, owl, tortured for what they know, done deal, if not dead already. But Tuello knocks at the door so the guard can open the escort Moira out, you know, because she's being disrespectful. How dare her tell this bitch off? That's called for, Tuello says. Fuck you. I'm so glad Moira said that. I ain't got to be nice to the bitch to enslave me. You help enslave me. Her motherfucking husband raped me too. Fuck you. I'm so glad she told him that. She should have told Serena Joy that too. Fuck you too, bitch. Jelly Bean didn't even have to be there. Jelly Bean didn't even want to be held by her ass. That social worker was like, you know, she just got stranger anxiety. Stranger danger. Stranger danger, Jelly Bean. Stranger fucking danger. Well, back at the crib. Lois is on the phone arguing possibly with Calhoun. They want to go to war, like you said. Lois is like, what part do you not understand? You can't close the fucking borders. You'll kill our trading and essentially our economy. I'm like, who the fuck is trading with them? Canada? Because that's the border they're talking about right now. I know Mexico is trading with them, but that's not the border that's in question. You mean to tell me that the Canadians are trading with these motherfuckers? Really? He said it. How, if you want to see our society fail, fuck with our trade. Canada is helping them not fail by trading with them. Oh, my God. I can't believe this shit. Canada getting on my damn nerves at this point. I can't. I can't. Oh, my goodness. 
He need June to move the damn plane data. We ain't got much time. They might close the fucking border. She said, I can't do that. The plane come once a week. It's on a schedule. We can't make it look like it's not legit. You're going to have to get them to get the uh, border open. And then we hear all of a sudden footsteps again. Head towards the door. Eleanor, where the fuck you going? I'm going down the street. What you mean you went down the street? <laughs> oh, she going across the street to get this little boy named Dave. You know, we could save him. Now June shuts the door and say, no, nah, we don't need to do that. We'll take care of him. We good, ma. What about the little blonde girl down the street I need to tell her parents? You say, no, 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 no. We ain't going to tell nobody's parents, right? Well, what about Hannah? What about the other children? Let's go back to the school. Eleanor headed for the door again. June snatched her ass up and shook the shit out of her. <laughs> Shut the shit out of her. You better keep your damn mouth closed. Shut the hell up. No, we ain't telling nobody. And um, uh, Joey Lawrence is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. She's like, no, you should have kept your fucking mouth closed. I was like, this she really just, and he's still standing there. That's enough. It's enough. It's enough. Eleanor just, oh, no, she's right. She's right. It's my bad. I was out of pocket. I'm like, Lawrence, Lawrence, come on now. This woman just shake the shit out of your mentally ill wife like that, and you just gonna be like, enough. Where the fuck happened to our Lawrence? What happened to him? Anyway, Lawrence tell Eleanor, think about us. Think about the life we could have. We could leave all this behind. Eleanor ain't wrapped too tight. We know this, right? But she ain't stupid. We can't leave this behind. It's gonna forever be with us. That that that's we're gonna always carry this burden on our back. We can't leave it behind. I think not, sir. I think not. Now Luke goes there and there and meets with Fred. Fred say, uh, Tuello manipulated Serena Joy um, and used that baby as a crutch. But, but Serena is a master manipulator herself. She didn't need no convincing. This was all her idea. You need to just work with us, boy. Fred, like, boy, bye. I can't be any manipulated either. Really? You can't? How you end up there, Fred, if you couldn't be manipulated? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Anyway. Fred is so damn cocky with Luke and his little godlike complex and he saved the world and shit. What did you do? And if uh, Luke said, well, you know what, I just take pleasure in the fact that you're going to sit here rotting this jail knowing that your wife betrayed you. He said, oh, my wife, what about yours? Basically, Fred told him that uh, your woman wanted to be with me. I changed her. Gilead changed her. Luke cold clocked his ass. Got another couple jab in. I swear I wish Moira would have got some jabs in on Serena's ass. Luke was like, I'm not done. I'm not done. <laughs> June comes in uh, to bring Eleanor's food and lets her self in the room as usual. Eleanor's on the bed, breaths laboring, the wind blowing softly, dogs barking in the distance. Um, there's pills on the bedside, and she's taking most of them. June panics, try to wake her up, but only for a brief moment. She heads to the door and stops and thinks, well, if she dies, she can't fuck up our plans. If she dies, she's free from this world. If she dies, if she dies, fuck it, just let her die. And you hear Eleanor's breath get shallow, more shallow than the last breath. Her breaths are struggling to enter and, and, and escape her body. This dog's still walking in the distance. She wheezing. <laughs> and gasps that she's no more. And then more dogs are walking. Footsteps to hear him outside. The wind is howling. June places a gentle kiss on Eleanor's forehead and quietly exits the room. The door creaks. The footsteps. The food tray slides against the floor. The door closes. The locks clicks. Her footsteps lead softly down the hallway. The wind blows as June enters her room and she stares, lays on the bed and stares, stares into that fucking camera again. The morning light cascades across her face. She hasn't slept a week at night. Serena screams. The uh, Sienna screams. The birds chirp outside the window. Casualty of war. That's what Eleanor has become. Serena awakens to a view of her wedding band and the ring finger that has been mutilated, reminding her of what she had to give up and what she lost. Tuella brings her pizza and the paper for her enjoyment. You like you may want to catch up with the rest of the world. More signs to me that she's going to get away with this shit. Serena's looking like this may not be so bad after all after he exits and locks the door behind him. Well, back at the crib, it looks as if they're preparing for a repass. You hear the food being chopped up, the oven dings, the plates being stacked. They don't look sad at all. Not one person, not even Lawrence looks sad in this moment to me. And I was wondering if he's going to even bother to still help her. His only reason for doing it is to get Eleanor free, and she's free now. 
because he, he may not believe in all the Gilead ways, but he still believes in his core values and his original purpose. And when he spoke about losing trade, that was a man deeply concerned to me. Um, it wasn't just simply about the borders. I think he was really concerned about the economy of, of Gilead as well. Um, and Lawrence is a man of great restraint, but I'm still expecting him to be to break down more. I was still expecting him to break down more. Um, he tells June he's gonna keep the borders open for. Her. I was like, what? I'm so shocked. Like, I, I was shocked to see the concern for him at this point. Um, maybe it's because what Eleanor wanted. Maybe I don't know. Um, he blames himself for not letting for letting her. He blames himself for letting her be alone. Um, maybe uh, I should have checked on her. June was like, no, I should have checked on her too. What did I say about last week about her needing to make a connection? When you're manipulating somebody and negotiating with them, you want them to feel connected and bonded with you. And this is what she's doing. June is like, no, I should have checked on her too. Um, she needs him to feel that they are the same in this moment. They are one. We need to be strong together. Most funerals, people do that. They come to you by your side. They want to hold you and cry with you. They want you to feel that you're not in this alone. Okay. Um, I don't think people realize how manipulative this is. I don't think people really realize how manipulative this is. Um, maybe it's because you do it. Maybe that's why you're trying to deny that this is manipulation. Or maybe it's because it's you. And I'm talking about you being manipulated this way. You don't want to feel convicted. Either way, June needs him to stay on her side because she knows he has no reason right now to help her out. She manipulated him into this deal and now her leverage is gone. So even though she may feel something for Eleanor's death, she needs him to feel as if they are together. When he walked away, she breathed again. She's happy he's still helping out. She even smiled in her relief. Like, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so after the funeral, June comes and stands by Lauren's side. You want to be alone? Again, she needs to feel him connected to her. He didn't push her away so that eases her mind. She steps up right by his side, parallel with him, even stands there and crosses her hands exactly as he did. They look upon one another. Their bond is strong, she believes. But there is something in that look that he gave her that caused me concern that made me say he's going to do exactly what I'm saying he's reconsidering hoping her he has no reason to um y'all know that that's how you break a dog too you know what I'm saying I don't know how you do it y'all stir at each other whoever breaks the stir first they the ones that's going to be uh, the whoever doesn't break the stir first is the, the, the master the aggressor I had to train my dog that way he knows that I'm the master of him um, he tests me every once in a while. You got to stir a motherfucker down. You can't do it to every dog, though. The bitches will attack. I, I did this for my dog as early on. Don't do it to no grown-ass dog. You try to stir them down. They may fuck you up. Because they, they take that as a challenge. My dog still takes that as a challenge because he tests me every now and then. But I have to stand strong because that's the way I trained him. But anyway, he's looking at her like this is your fault. She wouldn't be dead if it wasn't for you. I've let you manipulate me. I've lost the love of my life. All because of you. Um, like I said, there should be no reason for June to even stay in that house, though. Um, because I think it looked like she was going to go off with Aunt Lydia. And she asked Aunt Lydia to give her a moment. Um, but if she's back at the Red Center, how is she going to you know, make this plan go through? She should not go back to that house. And why should she not go back to the house? There's no wife. There's no wife to conceive for. She's not just going to be fucking Joey Lawrence just to give him kids. The wife is the one who needs the children. It's a family unit. I can't see her being back at the house. If they leave her at the house, uh, uh, something is wrong with the writing. Something is wrong with the writing. I'm going to have to say something to the Hulu people again, to the, the, the Handmaid's Tale people again. There's no reason June should be back at this house. So how is this plan going to go through, right? But she's standing there. Um, Rita, she should be off in a new fucking home as well, too. Her commanders are gone. But okay, my thought is that since Olivia has no husband, and he has no wife, then they're going to do a prearranged marriage and put them together. 
But Olivia's husband is not technically dead yet, but until they declare him dead. And like once they declare him dead, she becomes a widow and the widows walk around and all this black and shit. But I could have sworn that the widows got to keep their children, even though she said that they're going to take the children away from her. Maybe that's the difference between this and the book. Because in the books, the widows kept their children. Um, matter of fact, the widows are permitted to marry again because it's not against uh, Gilead law. Divorces was against the law. Like I said, that may be different from the book, though. But, yeah, the, the look he gave her was like, I'm not on your team anymore. Fuck you and feed your grits. Dry ass grits. Yeah, I ever try to eat dry grits and choke your shit out. Fuck you and feed your grits is what he's basically said to her. That's the look he gave to her for me. That's what I saw. I don't know if that's what you saw, too. But anyway, while she's standing there, they focus on her fucking face again, staring up at this guy. Such a long, damn, annoying stare into the camera. OMG. But that silent stare between them, after they shared that look, and he continued to look at her, and she looked ahead, all stately and shit, that silence said a lot to me, baby. It said a lot to me. Thank y'all for coming. This is the end of this recap and review. Leave your comments down in the comment section. Next week is our season finale. I should have the link to my book, baby. Yes. We got next week up for the pre-sale. Thank y'all. I got to get out here and go to work. Y'all have a good day. Peace.